yeah, there, there's a way in which it's almost like a little funny that the response to the 2020 protests was a new national holiday um, and not I, anything. I, we are in agreement. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here with you on this. I think that Juneteenth is worth celebrating for all Americans. Like the specific, you know, ask, the specific. That this is how we got here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey, y'all. Welcome to The Amendment, a weekly conversation about gender, politics, and power from the 19th News and Wonder Media Network. I'm your host, Erin Haynes. So happy Juneteenth to all who celebrate. And by the way, that should be you and all of your fellow Americans. Why? Because in 2021, the Biden administration officially made Juneteenth into a federal holiday. It was the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Jr. Day was adopted in 1983. That's a little over 150 years after the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans in Texas, the event that we commemorate on June 19th. The day not only reminds us of the brutal legacy of slavery, but is also an opportunity for us to celebrate liberation. Juneteenth serves as a time for reflection on the ongoing struggles and achievements of the African-American community. But was the signing of Juneteenth into into a federal holiday a big step, or was it just a symbolic gesture? The declaration that arguably many Black Americans did not ask for came amid a racial reckoning when Black Americans were calling for things like passing criminal justice reform or shoring up voting rights, legislation that has still not made it through a deeply divided Congress. We know that history matters, but what more significant policy changes should follow that center African-Americans? And what do those policies look like? To help me answer those questions on this holiday, I brought in my friend, the brilliant New York Times columnist, Jamel Bowie, who has written extensively on how our country's past shapes our present. Hi, Jamel. Welcome to The Amendment. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. So, You came to mind for this conversation on this holiday because 10 years ago, you wrote an article in Slate called The Black American Holiday Everyone Should Celebrate But Doesn't. And in that article, you were advocating for Juneteenth to become a national holiday. So I guess that makes you a psychic. But this was back when most non-Black Americans probably didn't even know what Juneteenth was. Probably some still don't. Uh, So I just want to start with that. I mean, back then, how did you explain what Juneteenth was to people who didn't know anything about the holiday? Why was it important for you to bring this holiday to light and really advocate to make it a national holiday? So I think I, I think I explained it, you know, the way more or less the way that it's understood these days, which is that it marks the uh, the holiday. It marks the day when enslaved Africans in um, you know Texas learned of the Emancipation Proclamation and really learned of the end of the Civil War. Um, and thus their kind of like nominal freedom at the very least. And my argument for celebrating it as a national holiday, I think at the time was simply that like it's important to celebrate emancipation. It's like a major and important moment in American history. I think if I were going to make the argument again today, it would be not just that emancipation in itself is like this genuinely important moment in the country's history that is worth celebrating for its own sake, but that when we think about what the modern United States is, our conception of the modern United States, our conception of what the, and when I say that, what I mean is sort of like, as a, we are a singular nation, not simply like a collection of a bunch of, you know, quasi sovereign states, but we're a single nation um, with a, a single federal government that repre- nom- att- attempts to represent this all um, and our, constitution secures and guarantees rights for all Americans wherever they live that is a that, that is a notion of american citizenship and the american nation that comes directly out of the civil war that comes specifically out of the long effort to abolish slavery and really begins to come to fruition with emancipation and the constitutional constitutional amendments that are subsequently passed in the years following the war that are an attempt to make the promises of emancipation real. So, you know, if I were making the argument today, it would be that, you know, July 4th celebrates our independence, um, but Juneteenth and, 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 and the celebration of emancipation really celebrates the nation that we are. Um, we aren't the nation of 1776 or 1788 when the Constitution was ratified. We're not that country anymore. We haven't been for a long time, but we are the country that emerges after the Civil War. Yeah, I mean, that's so interesting to think about Juneteenth being our national holiday about freedom, right? And and freedom for all people, right? Not just 
right. the folks who who uh, kind of the framers had in mind when, when they talked about freedom in our founding documents. That is that is that is such a good point and such a good case for uh, Juneteenth as a national holiday that we should all participate in and that we should all celebrate. I want to talk about what role specifically African American communities in Texas have played in really preserving and promoting the significance of Juneteenth over the decades and why it's important to remember that work today. I'm, I'm obviously thinking a lot about Opal Lee uh, as we are celebrating Juneteenth and, and just her unrelenting dedication to, to making sure that not only everybody in her community and in her home state understood that Juneteenth mattered, but really in, 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 in helping to convince our president that, that, that this holiday mattered. For for most of the holidays history, it was actually like a very specifically, you know, uh, a Texas holiday, like Black Americans in Texas celebrated some in Louisiana and Mississippi, sort of like in that region of the South that it was it was quite local. Um, and it doesn't really if I have my kind of history right, it doesn't really begin to expand beyond there until during the Great Migration, when you have Black Americans from Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi traveling to other or, or migrating to other, other parts of the country, to Los Angeles, to Detroit, to Gary, Indiana, to Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's even as it becomes national in that way with Black Americans moving throughout the country, it's still it's very much tied to like a specific yeah. community of Black Americans and that you could call it diaspora of like descendants yeah. of enslaved Africans coming from this particular region of the country. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that. I think it's important to, to recognize that a, not every single black American ha has been aware of or yeah. knows this holiday. It's not a part of every black American community right. celebration. It is, it is quite specific um, and yeah. local. And this story um, of these uh, enslaved Americans learning of their freedom is one that's been preserved yeah. by this community of Black Americans um, over you know the 150 years, 160 years since those events took place. I think it's really important to acknowledge, even as someone like myself makes the case for treating this as a more expansive holiday. And I'll say, you know, this wouldn't be the first time that a holiday that had its origins with specific communities of Black Americans becomes national. What we know is Memorial Day. You know this, Aaron. I was just going to say Memorial Day started with us as well. Yeah. Right. Memorial Day begins in South Carolina with formerly enslaved Black Americans marking the deaths of Union soldiers. Um, and it was called Decoration Day. And for a long time in the South, white Southerners did not celebrate Memorial Day. I think recognizing and honoring the origins are is important both for its own sake again like it's important to give credit to people for the work that they do but also i think that doesn't mean that this cannot be something that all americans can share in yeah i, I really like the point that you're making about you know memorial day's re really evolution uh to, to being a national holiday something with its origins in uh you know, the Af African-American history and the African-American community, but something that gradually came to be seen by all Americans as something worth celebrating, as something that we could collectively celebrate. Uh, I actually was recently in uh, Galveston, which is where the Juneteenth Museum is. That may not necessarily be a place where a lot of people may ever get to visit, may ever, uh, you know, go to Galveston, much less the museum. And yet this story that radiates out of this community and then out of this state and now across the country. I mean, it actually makes me think, I think probably the first time I was aware of Juneteenth as, as a uh, Black person was in college. Like I had a friend from Texas that mentions this holiday and it's like, oh, okay. And then, you know, I learn more about it that way. When do you remember even learning about Juneteenth? Or, I mean, was it something that your family celebrated when you were growing up? No, no, we're all we're all we're all from from Florida and Georgia. So a bit a bit outside of our, our uh, you know, cultural heritage it's interesting you know you, you you sometimes you like you you have facts in your mind or like people yeah. you know but you can't remember when you learned them that's or when what you i'm met thinking them. it's sort of like i can't remember when i learned about juneteenth i want to say it almost certainly I, I i grew up in a very kind of like black history household um, Same. <laughs> so i want to say that like i just learned it through sort of like general osmosis, osmosis you know yeah. of like being of you know 
of talking about black history all the time. It's funny, like like I said, I, and I can't even remember who who it was. Like it was definitely, but it was definitely somebody from Texas, like who made me aware of this holiday. And then I asked my mom about it, and of course, somebody from Texas who had been a friend of hers when she was younger put her on to Juneteenth, but it wasn't like something that our family celebrated. Like my mom also understood it to very much be a thing that that black people in Texas knew about and celebrated, but it 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 was their holiday. It wasn't necessarily um, for the rest of black America, much less for the rest of, of the country. Um, we all remember in 2020 witnessing, you know, one of the biggest civil rights movements in our lifetimes with, you know, in the wake of the death of, of black people, including Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so in part as a response to those uprisings, you get the Juneteenth federal holiday a year later. How do you see those two things in relationship to each other? And how do you think that decision really kind of impacted American understandings of, of Black history? You know, this is back when we were actually still reckoning with that kind of thing. Right. And Black history was a thing that that so many more Americans uh, were trying to become more aware of and learn more about. Right. So... Yeah, there, there's a way in which it's almost like a little funny that the response to the 2020 protests was a new national holiday um, and not I, anything. I, we are in agreement. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here with you on this. Please, please continue. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it really it really does. As much as I think it's sort of like, I think that Juneteenth is worth celebrating for all Americans. Like the specific, you know, ask, the specific. That this is how we got here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. The specific uh, um, ask of those protests wasn't like a new national holiday. No. And, you know, I, I myself have always been a little like reticent and like ambivalent about the, the language of like racial reckoning because it wasn't the ask of that wasn't even sort of like reckon with the country's racism. It was sort of like we want specific things to happen for people to make their lives better. <laughs> Uh, and so in, in the framework of like racial reckoning, like it actually does make sense to, you know, create a Juneteenth national holiday and and have it, you know, be an opportunity for education. And, um, you know, there's been some reconstruction national monuments that have been marked in the, in the years since. Like all that makes sense in the framework of like education, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense in the framework of like there are specific things we should do to improve the lives of black people in particular, but sort of like broadly speaking, most Americans and so I've always I've always been a little a little like I said ambivalent about yeah. about this um especially since right you know although there are civic organizations doing um you know the kinds of remembrance and educational work um there really isn't any like broad effort to use Juneteenth as an occasion for um education about black history about history of the civil war like you know I live you know, an hour away from Civil War battlefield. I mean, if you live in Washington D.C., you live an hour from Civil War battlefield. So it's not like it's not like there's there's not opportunities to highlight um, the history yeah. here. But to an extent, Juneteenth has become like another occasion for like a day off during the summer. Which again, that's exactly days- what I was going to say. Yeah, it's like it's not um, the federal holiday as a day off as opposed to a day to actually reflect, to actually, you know, uh, talk about our our continued experiment of democracy and how, uh, you know, the ongoing work of liberation and freedom, you know, like, how can we talk about that? How can we get there? Uh, You know, what are the policies that that, uh, maybe are are still needing to be advanced to get to the full liberation of of everybody in this country, right? Uh, And Black Americans in particular, but that is absolutely not what it is. It is, uh, yeah, a chance to maybe not go to work and, and uh, you know, to have that in the same kind of climate where you don't get strengthened Voting Rights Act and, and you don't get any progress on criminal justice reform. I mean, it certainly kind of rang hollow in that moment for me. And then, yeah. you know, here we are three years later and we still don't have, uh, you know, a lot of those things, you know, that Black people were actually pushing for. In fairness, some of this is maybe just a function of it being a summer holiday, right? Like, it's easy. It's it's easier to be reflective on MLK Day because it's like in the middle of January. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, hello. We have fi- we have fireworks on the Fourth of July at least, and and, and, yeah. and flags and celebrations and parades, even you know everywhere. Like what what would it mean to actually publicly collectively celebrate Juneteenth as a country? Like we have yet to really see right, right. 
that. And I'm not talking, I mean, you know, I know the White House, you know, just, just recently had their Juneteenth celebration, but that is not something that the entire public is, is necessarily participating in. And I'll say, I think part of, part of the difficulty or part of the challenge is that not all Americans have like integrated slavery into their understanding of sort of like national identity, if that makes any sense, right? Yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. To, 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 I think to a large extent, a lot of Americans, um, especially those who are more recent arrivals, and when I say recent arrivals, I don't just mean, you know, like immigration post-1965. I mean, Americans whose families immigrate, immigrated here in the 1910s, 1920s, um, don't, can, they don't see themselves as connected to slavery. You often hear, right, like in response to, in conversations about reparations or, or anything like that, you hear, well, my family wasn't here during then, so what does it have to do with me kind of thing. On this, At the same time, you know, most Americans will claim 1776 and they'll claim mm -hmm. um, 1787. They'll claim George Washington and the Continental Army. And, well, and why not, right? Because that's that's part of our the the, the myths of our origin right. story. I mean, not you know, not that those things didn't happen, but it's part they become mythologized right. and, and romanticized in a way that feels good to us, right? right? That's the part of our past that feels good. And slavery um, obviously does not feel slavery good. does not feel good. The flip side of slavery not really being integrated into, I think, a lot of Americans' understanding of the country is that the struggle against slavery isn't either, and so. You know, people know Lincoln and they know the Emancipation Proclamation, but there's like this more, this longer, more interesting story to tell about, you know, several generations of Americans, by no means a majority, like a quite a small minority, but nonetheless, um, uh, several generations of Americans, black and white, struggling against slavery, and eventually that struggle having real consequences for the entire nation. Yeah. And if we like buy the idea that like America as it exists today is a product of the Civil War and not really a product of the founding, um, then America as it exists today is part of the afterlife of the abolitionist movement. And that's something mm -hmm. that people should celebrate. It should be part of, you should like when you, when you if you're thinking of reasons to be proud to be an American, this should be one of the things you should be proud of. But because, think I think precisely because slavery itself is just sort of like shunted to the side and like said oh, this is a thing that black people care about but like the rest of us don't have to that means that the other story doesn't get told either and there's not there's no really rituals around it there's no really rituals around the the symbols and the ideas and everything um yeah yeah and also i mean look I, I, i'm even just thinking about the abolition movement and how it was treated in some corners of our country even then, right? I mean, it was to the extent that, that there were white people involved in the abolition movement, uh, you know, folks who were feeling like, you know, why are these people, you know, scolding us, right. you know, for, for, you know, for, for this practice. Of, so, so the hostility towards um, white people in the abolition movement, I mean, is that something that our country has moved past, can move past? Can we embrace these folks as, to your point, um, among the patriots who 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 helped to really get us to the more perfect union that that uh, you know that the framers had in mind, but but for people that they did not necessarily right. have in mind. We don't we yeah. don't we don't think of when you say founders, people think Jefferson, Madison, yes. Washington, Adams, et cetera. They don't think William Lloyd Garrison or uh, Frederick Douglass Frederick Douglass, or yeah. um, uh, you know. Harry Beecher Stowe, right? Like they don't, they don't think any of these people, um, even though they're names that most people learn, but they don't like think about them in that way. And right. so, but we should, but we should, we should. Yeah, absolutely. And, and ideally Juneteenth could become an opportunity for thinking about yes, a vehicle for that. Well, uh, folks at home may not be able to see this, but I am in fact wearing a Juneteenth shirt. It is not from Target. <laughs> however, it is uh, shout out to black market vintage, which uh, made these amazing, Shirts that I love, but uh, we do have to talk about, you know, Juneteenth as a national holiday means that it has also been commercialized. Yeah. And I want to talk about the implications of this commercialization for the African American community. I mean, wh wh what do you think about that? I mean, part of me, I'm always, when I see stuff like that, I'm always sort of like, yeah, this is, this is America. We commercialize everything. And I kind yes. of just, I, I see it as sort of like, I'll put it this way. If if no one were trying to make a few stacks off of Juneteenth, I think that might actually be like a little more worrisome. If you if you see what I'm saying, 
right? Sort of like it just has no impact whatsoever. But the fact that like what was it last year, two years ago, like Walmart was selling like a Juneteenth red velvet ice cream. Like that's in addition to being very funny. I forgot about that. I forgot about the Walmart red velvet Juneteenth flavor. Is that still a thing? That to me is a sign at least that sort of like it's part of like the mainstream at this point that like True. people are trying to like make money, trying to sell to to an audience. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, it, it is a marker that, that the holiday has gone mainstream. All holidays in this country are commercialized. That doesn't mean that, you know, those of us who would think that there are more important messages here shouldn't speak up and say what those messages are. And that does not mean that those of us who think that, you know, to the extent that Juneteenth, the national holiday is a response to 2020, um, those of us who are like, yeah, I don't know about that should be clear why we're ambivalent about that and say, you know, yeah. what what ought to have come out of the 2020 protest was not just commitments to criminal justice reform and voting rights, but commitments to building a more robust and fair economy that can um, uh, provide black Americans and all Americans with opportunity, commitments to you know strengthening um, the social safety net and providing the kinds of resources and such that like all Americans, but especially many black Americans need to be able to like thrive in this country. Like that to me is the ask of 2020. That to me is maybe some of the actionable ideas that can come out of Juneteenth. Yeah. Um, because of course the, the, the story of emancipation it's not just the story of congratulations, you're free, but also the story of black Americans trying to realize that freedom in real and concrete ways and making demands on the federal government for the things that they need to succeed. Then it was, you know, 40 acres and a mule. It was land. Um, uh, now it is the equivalent of land, like various resources and opportunities and access to capital and access to education. Um that that can uh, help people thrive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. In many ways, Juneteenth was was the beginning of you know the path to full citizenship. Right. For for us, truly full citizenship and participation, uh, equal full and equal participation in this democracy. There is no multiracial United States of equals, or as much as we can be equals. Um, Without the contributions of formerly enslaved Americans and Absolutely. their descendants, right? Full stop. Like the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees birthright citizenship. Birthright citizenship exists because free blacks in the antebellum America were adamant that they were citizens of the United States, that they, they did not belong anywhere else, that this was their country as well, um, and it's through birthright citizenship, right, that subsequent generations of immigrants to this country can lay a claim on this country through their children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. And so if we think of Juneteenth as the beginning of a struggle for freedom, it's a struggle for freedom that isn't just about black people. It's ultimately about like every American who calls this place home. Um, and uh, and every person who wants to call this place home, right? Like it's 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 the struggles of Black Americans who like open the door to this being a much more inclusive country than it was ever envisioned as. I hear you really kind of framing how you know what what this holiday means to you. I wonder. I mean, it sounds like knowing what you know now, maybe you might make some amendments to that 2014 slate article. Maybe it's time for an updated <laughs> Juneteenth. Uh, column. I'm your editor now. Okay. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> I mean, how, how how would you kind of uh, you know we're on the amendment, so you know how would you how would you maybe amend that case today? Are there any kind of asterisks that you would include? Sure. I think I think the big thing is I would like straightforwardly, as we've been doing in our conversation here, I would straightforwardly acknowledge like the weird circumstances of getting a Juneteenth national holiday, and to be like, yeah, this isn't this isn't something that solves problems. <laughs> <laughs> or cured racism. It that part doesn't cure racism. Happen. It doesn't do any of that. It it's it doesn't do any of that. Um, but what it does do is uh, provide uh, again opportunities for those of us who think that the history of this country should be taken much more seriously by more people, and that 
there are there are moments that we should look toward to that aren't just the 1780s or like the 1940s. Like that's those are yeah. the two big ones, right? Sort of like it's either the founding or World War II. And we kind of skip over you know, the Civil War was bad. And you know, of course, people are like look at sort of skeptical eyes of people who like, you know, are a little too into the Confederacy. <laughs> but like what that war was about, what that moment was about, doesn't get as much, you know, play in uh, our contemporary uh, discourse. Yeah, I mean, well, P.S. We don't even have a shared set of facts of, around what that war was about. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and so that's, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's like the main amendment. I would, I would, it would be sort of the update I would do is to sort of say like circumstances of this are weird. Nonetheless, this is still valuable for these reasons. And I would, I would like make a broader case for people to like take more interest in, in the Civil War. And it's yeah. aftermath for for these reasons because I, I really do think that is the moment that makes the United States. I would encourage people if they you know visit Washington D.C. to go to the Lincoln Memorial and not to read the Gettysburg Address. The Gettysburg Address, you know, important piece of American rhetoric. But every time I go to the Lincoln Memorial, and I kind of <laughs> I go every time I go to D.C. these days because I like it. I like the space. Um, there are always tons of people reading the Gettysburg Address, and there's mm-hmm. no one reading the other side which is Lincoln's second inaugural, which has much, which is much more in line with what we've been talking about. Like in Lincoln's second inaugural, he says, right? Like this war is because of slavery. This is, you know, this war that we are experiencing is our, you know, is the fruit of our, of our labor as people who tolerated this in our country. And we, um, we have to pay a debt and that debt, um, however long it takes us to pay that debt, however painful it is, it will be just. We we will be we will be we will be doing the thing we must do. I think that's a message that's like important to hear. Um, yeah, and it's it's always been interesting to me that like people don't want to read that. Um, they well, weren't. he went there. He went there, right? Yeah. And 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 what you're talking about in in if you would do an amendment is is you going there and, and not even at, maybe realizing at the time that that. We needed to go there. That certain things maybe needed to be explicitly <laughs> said for people. But 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 I want to circle back on something something else that you were saying. I mean, you know, we, we're talking about you know this coming out of res- response to the racial reckoning um, from 2020, and and what I hope this holiday didn't do for people uh, was was exactly to what we were saying a minute ago. Like Juneteenth did not cure racism, right? Like that was not that should not be. Uh, you know, where people kind of stop reckoning. But four years later, it does feel to me like like uh, in a lot of ways, the country, the country is done reckoning. So I want to think about Juneteenth in a 2024 context, three years after the holiday, but also as we head into uh, November, as we continue to just remain a very racially polarized, uh, politically polarized country. Um, how would you kind of think about these past four years in the Black Lives Matter era, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of Ferguson. Like, have we seen material changes? Are we in the same spot that we were in before? Are we in a worse spot around this? Yeah. On criminal justice reform and voting rights specifically, there has not been big signature legislation. And I think that is the kind of thing that leads people to say, well, there has not really been any progress. I think it's important to recognize that so much of the work that gets done on, on both these issues does happen through executive branch enforcement, right? It happens through the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. It happens through um, other executive branch agencies, Health and Human Services, um, Housing and Urban Development, like prioritizing um, uh, dealing with like racial inequality, dealing with um, uh, discrimination, these sorts of things. And so, on those fronts, right there, there has been like there's been there's been work done. Like the executive, br- the <laughs> the executive branch being in the hands of people who think it should do the job it was created to do um, has real impact on people's day to day lives. From again prosecuting housing and job discrimination, which is still quite widespread, to um, uh, investigating police departments and such. Um, for you know, pattern practice investigations. Um, you know, as as both as people who follow this stuff for a living, like this to me is progress. But I also understand that because there's no big signature legislation, it does not seem like anything really is happening. We'll be right back.
you know, another thing that occurs to me about you know, just thinking about for, thinking back four years ago, as as you know, we're we're covering now um, another presidential election cycle. Four years ago, reparations was on the table, right? Like we were having serious conversations about reparations in like a national uh, presidential campaign uh, climate, and and I don't feel like that's the case anymore. What happened to that conversation? Why do you think? that that conversation is off the table now and and do we need to bring it back should com- you know conversations around reparations be happening again i I'm, I'm thinking we got a debate coming up i don't think we're going to get a question about reparations on the debate stage yeah that's interesting i mean my 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 sense is that conversations over reparations are one of those things that people pursue when they feel that the space is open to it and they back off when it seems that it might not be right so um, in the moment of these protests, it seems like expansive space for talking about something like reparations. Um, in a moment like 2024, where it does seem as if, you know, lots is teetering on the balance, it's probably not going to show up. Um, I've always had this this view that kind of like the funny thing about reparations is that the kind of United States that would pursue earnestly a program for reparations might be the kind of United States that doesn't need them, if that makes any sense. Like the kind yeah. of political environment you would have in which the state is willing to like, you know, pay for, if not slavery, if not the afterlife of slavery, then at least sort of reparations for Jim Crow, for example. Um, in that world, I imagine that that's a world where there is already kind of like a robust and generous social safety net where there already is robust and protection for voting rights or already robust criminal justice reform, right? It's sort of like... That's the kind of political energy you would need to build reparations, um, build the kind of energy for reparations. Hmm. Uh, um, and so in my mind, I've always, I wouldn't, I wouldn't always, but I've come to see reparations as being a lodestar in the sense that you're trying to create the world where that kind of thing really is possible and the kind of world you've created is one in which so many of the material challenges are already being overcome, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, you know, what, what I am also thinking about, um, and this I think also applies in a, in a Juneteenth context. I mean, you've had like I said, openly pushing for so long to get the rest of the country to care about to care about Juneteenth. You know, Opalie is is certainly somebody who is up in age now. She's not gonna be here, honestly, for too many more Juneteenths, right? There are there are fewer Juneteenths ahead of her than there than there are uh behind her. So, you know, what does it mean to not really have champions of issues like these really on the front line who picks up reparations after this? I don't know. Right. That gets to something that is just, I think, a fact of like, you know, living in a democratic society, which is that like it ultimately has to be all of us who take an interest yes. in this, all of us who have a commitment to it. It has to be kind of all of our responsibility. Yeah. Um, and something that we 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 pressure, certainly elected representatives, we elect people who will promise to make this um an issue. And we we continue to push for a world where um, these things can get a serious hearing. I'm thinking about, you know, in Oklahoma, um, yeah. the Oklahoma Supreme Court basically like cut the slam the lid on reparations for the Tulsa massacre of 1921. Yeah. Um, which for which there's still two survivors, right? So two people who were children are still living. And the state of Oklahoma was making the argument that like, hey, you know, it's really terrible what happened, but it was a long time ago. Which, which really is like the strategy, right? Like you kind of just wait yes. it out. And then once it gets to be a while, you say, well, you know, who's to say? And yet you had these two, these two people who were children who were, th- they were to say. Right, they were you know, to and say, they right? did, And they tried to say. For me, what that illustrates, to kind of loop, loop back around, if one, it illustrates that like you, part of any project for racial justice is going to take place in a, in a, in a broader environment in which people are, are thinking of um, how are, 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 are willing to use the state in ways that sort of like ameliorate suffering and ameliorate injustice. The modern civil rights movement that emerges out of Montgomery 
it's not like an accident that it happens in the context of like the New Deal order when people are, mm-hmm. are can can look at the state as a thing that can like assist people and right. isn't just um, and isn't hands off on, an institution for redress. Right. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, you look at modern Oklahoma. You look at Oklahoma politics the last ten years. Not a place where this, where people are looking to the state for redress. Not a place that is hospitable to anything like claims about rights. Um, claims about justice. And I think that when you're looking to the future, whether it's Juneteenth or reparations or any kind of quest for racial justice, I think at, 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 at the front of your mind has to be, how do we build coalitions? How do we build um, a political environment where we understand the national government, Congress, to be a place for redress, um, that a, a place that we don't just owe obligations to it. It owes up. Ob- it owes things to us as well. Um, yeah. To your point, I mean, like that's not yet the country that we have now. We are still very much a country of contradictions, like which is why we can have a Juneteenth holiday in the same moment that you have affirmative action being overturned. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? So like, um, and 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 obviously that was you know I you know we knew then that that higher education was only the beginning of that uh, action. Uh, what do you make of, of the backlash to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, uh, which were a huge part of uh, the racial reckoning uh, and, and now seem to be a huge target in, in our uh, political culture wars um, as we head into this election? Yeah, I mean, this is another place where I'm very ambivalent, right? Like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> uh, diversity, you equity, have to laugh. Inclusion. You have to laugh. Yeah, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts don't really deal with material problems facing you know many Black Americans, right? It's sort of like, what does that have to say? Not just the housing discrimination, but to the fact that in many places where Black Americans live, like housing is incredibly unaffordable, and there isn't very much of it to begin with, right? Like, okay. Um, uh, what does that have to say to, you know, criminal justice reform, like all, all the material things. So it's like, okay, uh, in response to all of this fervent, you're gonna, you know, hire some people who will talk about ways to better hire people. I guess that's okay. Like, I think, I think diversity is good. I think inclusion is good. And so to the extent that company private corporations and companies and universities want to pursue that like i'm not going to say that that that's a bad thing but it certainly it certainly is um uh it's not it's not like a solution to anything on the flip side though the the backlash to dei very much is not just about those programs but about the broader notion of like integration at all right like it's about yes. it's about the inclusion of black people in anything. It's about a state that works to the advantage or, or sees racial inequality as a problem to solve to begin with. So DEI doesn't fix anything really, but anti-DEI is certainly symptomatic of um, efforts that will make it difficult to fix things, right? Yeah, the DEI as a verb, as opposed to just a symbol or acronym, was the thing that that uh, became, you know, a, a bridge too far for folks who certainly do not want to see diversity, equity, and inclusion as things that are that are happening uh, in, in in this country. That's right. Yeah, um, and, and there has been backlash to policies that lift Black communities. I'm also, you know, thinking about uh, the Fearless Fund decision that happened recently, blocked from giving grants only to Black women. Um, I mean, you're talking about, you know, kind of the threat of, of anti-DEI. I mean, would do you feel like our progress is going backwards since 2020? And and how do we combat that if if you think so? Um, yeah, I, I I think I think there is a serious risk of us going backwards because this conservative legal movement is kind of weaponizing civil rights laws to basically create a situation where the, the neither the state nor really private actors can address racial inequality directly. Um, I mean that the fearless fund, um, the fearless fund decision uh, is disturbing for that reason, right? Because the, the majority uh, on that panel, the, the two judges who uh, supported the preliminary injunction 
did so on the basis of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was passed specifically to deal with like anti-black discrimination in the economic world, in the economic realm, right? And so it's sort of like it's cra- it's like legitimately crazy to say that a law passed to deal specifically with discrimination against black Americans in the making of contracts means um, because black Americans are being discriminated against and, and trying to get work means that black Americans today cannot take actions to deal with discrimination in the world of realm of economic life. And so to the extent that you have this conservative legal movement that is like weaponizing, you know, 1866 law, the 14th amendment, the, uh, 18, the 1964 civil rights act, um, to make it illegal to address racial inequality. That is like real danger of moving backwards. Um, And the only solution to that really um, is just, you know, a full on fight in politics, right? There's a reason that this is happening through the law and not on the, on, not on the battleground of elections, not on the field of, um, uh, of electoral politics. Because I think if people knew what was happening, they would like have a very negative reaction. Uh, Yeah. And so um, I think that's, you know, obviously fighting a legal battle, but also fighting a political battle and making it known that these are the political stakes, I think is important. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I also realize that we are not going to solve all of those problems by this Juneteenth. So <laughs> I wonder, I, I'm spending my Juneteenth actually uh, in conversation with uh, an artist whose work I really admire that that really focuses on themes of um memory and legacy and reconstructing, you know, narratives, especially uh, around our history and culture. What are you planning on doing for Juneteenth? Uh, Well, we will probably do some Black history stuff here at home. We are a Black history household uh, very much. And um, I know I have to make a trip up to Philadelphia, so I'll be doing some uh, Black history sightseeing in Philadelphia, I think. Um, well, I have many recommendations for you on that note. So yes, let me know. And I got you. I will. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, we, Juneteenth in our house was a very educational thing. So, um, we have lots of, I mean, I have like my bookshelf behind me, lots of books on history of slavery and African-American history. And then we have stuff like that for the kids as well. Um, so we'll be, we'll be doing lots of, lots of like history education. Well, look at that. Your kids are going to know about Juneteenth way before you did. <laughs> That's progress, I would say, if, if nothing else. Yes, yes. Well, Jamal, thanks for joining the amendment and thanks for celebrating Juneteenth with me this year. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So one last thing before we wrap this episode. The 19th is having a little free get together on July the 5th in New Orleans. So please join us and me uh, for a few hours of brunch, conversations, and solution sessions focused on building healthy communities in the face of climate change. Did I mention that this is going to be a great stop for locals or anybody that's in town for Essence Fest? Get more information, register today at 19thnews.org slash New Orleans, and I hope to see all of you there. The Amendment is a co-production of the 19th News and Wonder Media Network. It is executive produced by Jenny Kaplan, Terry Rupar, and Faith Smith. Wonder Media Network's head of development is Emily Rutter. Julia B. Chan is the 19th editor-in-chief. The amendment is edited by Jenny Kaplan, Grace Lynch, and Emily Rutter. And it is produced by Desawa Agbanile, Grace Lynch, Brittany Martinez, and Taylor Williamson. With production assistance from Lucy Jones and post-production support from Julie Bogan, Victoria Clark, Lance Dixon, and Winton Wong.